Hey guys, so today we're talking about osmosis and um, tonicity and water potential. So um, first we're going to talk about osmosis. This is um, a type of passive transport. So osmosis um, in water does both types of passive transport. It can do where it is passing directly through the membrane or it can do facilitated transport where it goes through um, channels. Okay. So osmosis is that diffusion of water. And this happens slowly when it goes through. And you can think about why that is. And that's because our water is polar and it doesn't want to easily go through that membrane with that non-polar region in the middle. So um, it's going to go slowly. And there are ways we can have it go faster. And that is through protein channels or there are specific ones called aquaporins. It's like water and pour. It's a pour allowing the water to go through. And that facilitates the diffusion. So facilitated diffusion can also occur. But we also can have just some simple diffusion occurring as well. So um, osmosis is just that water diffusing. And it's going to diffuse until we create an equilibrium. So we call this dynamic equilibrium because the water is still constantly moving back and forth. But it's going to... Um, the water will move until both sides, inside and outside of the cell, are equal in their concentrations. Um, you can think about this as water is going to move from a high concentration um, to a low concentration because the other things can't move through, through the membrane. So the water will move to dilute the particles. This is our idea of tonicity. So it's um, still our idea of osmosis water moving through um, and it's being crossing that selectively permeable membrane okay and so we have that membrane we have different types of solutions we can have isotonic where the cell um, the inside and outside of the cell are the same concentrations um, an example of this is red blood cells here they have um, they're their optimal shape because they're in an isotonic solution hypotonic solutions this is where we have too much um, water on the outside so we have a lower solute concentration outside the cell so because of that the water there's more concentration inside the cell the water will move into the cell causing it to swell and sometimes burst or lice and die and that can be really harmful to cells and then hypertonic solutions where there's more dissolved inside this the solution than inside the cell and that causes the water to move out of the cell and it can cause the cell, to, the cell to shrivel and become dehydrated and die. So for animal cells, we want an isotonic solution. And so here's some things that are symbolizing this. So solution has lower solute concentration than the cell. So that means the water will move to dilute inside the cell, making it swell. Isotonic, it's nice and happy, equal. It will still be moving, it's dynamic. And then hypertonic, there's a higher concentration in the solution, so the water will move out to dilute that as well. Okay, so here's some practice examples. Um, identify what type of solution and what will happen to the water. Okay, so this first one, we have, um, they're always going to tell you the percent of the solute, not the percent water, but you can think about the water is going to be moving. So there's a higher percentage here inside the cell. So, oops, I guess I don't have this so that I can. Okay, so here we have a higher concentration inside the cell of the solute and lower outside. So because of that, the water is going to want to move into our cell so it will cause that cell to swell and that's because this is a hypotonic solution the second one we have more solute outside so that water will move to the outside to try to dilute it and this will cause it to shrink so this is a hypertonic solution and it'll cause the cell to shrivel and shrink this last one, 50% each side, it is in dynamic equilibrium, so water will move freely in and out of the cell at about equal rates. Okay, so this is our idea of osmosis. We mentioned in animal cells, we kind of want that isotonic solution, but actually in plant cells, we prefer it to be 
um, in a hypotonic solution. So that's because we need that pressure um, to push against the side of the cell wall, that trigger pressure, and that's going to help with the structure of the shape of the plant cell. Um, also, you can think about how animals, we can go get, like, walk around and go get some water when we need it. Plants need to conserve their water and store it for longer periods of time. So they need to have more water stores in general. So they're going to have that um, normal for them would be in a hypotonic solution. It is possible to overwater a plant still and to have those cells burst. It's just much harder to do. Also, that cell wall is providing even more structure to prevent the cell from um, bursting as well. So um, in an isotonic for a plant, the vacuole is still has some water in it, but it's not pushing that pressure on it and it causes the plant to wilt. And then a hypertonic solution, the cell is called plasmalized and that's when it's the vacuole is really, really dried up and the plant is very likely going to die. So here's an um, example of a way that a plant can adapt and have um, Okay, this is not a plant, this is a paramecium, so it's an animal cell. So um, how it can use our vacuole, in this kind of time, a contractile vacuole to help in our different types of solution. So we can have a freshwater paramecium in an environment that it's able to, to survive. Okay, so think about what would happen if a freshwater paramecium was placed in salt water. So that salt water is going to make that cell shrivel up. Um, yeah, and it would, be, it would shrivel. That contractile vacuole is a, is a thing that can help our cells so that they are able to push out that extra water in a hypotonic solution. But if it was moved to a salt water solution, it would still have a problem. Okay, here's um, just a little example again with our hypertonic and hypotonic solutions. You can kind of look at which, which one is the best answer. Oops. Okay, so what happens when you have salt on a slug? And that is because it is going to cause them to dehydrate. So D, salt makes the water diffuse out of the cells because it becomes a hypertonic solution, making that snail shrivel up and die. Okay, so that's osmosis. Now we're gonna talk about water potential. Water potential is the tendency of water to move by osmosis. So it's just a way to measure our osmosis. Okay, and we use these fancy equations and this is on your equation sheet so you don't have to remember it. Um, but it's measured in bars. It's a pressure. So we can use bars to, to measure the pressure. Um, it can be a positive or negative value. The big thing to remember with this is that the more negative the value, the more likely the water is to move to an area. Okay, so pure water has a water potential of zero in an open container. So the water's not really going anywhere. So um, the water potential is equal to zero. It has no solutes and no pressure. So this P stands for pressure. It has no pressure because it's in an open container. It has no um, solutes because it's pure water. It has zero. So that means its overall water pressure, uh, water potential is, is zero because both of these things, the solutes and the pressure, um, are taken into account on how much the water will actually move itself. Okay, so that means because of that, um, in an open system, meaning we don't have pressure, our water potential is going to equal our um, solute potential. And so this is most of the time what we're going to be looking at. So most of the time we will assume that our water potential is equal to our solute potential. We have another equation, and that is water um, potential of our solute is equal to negative ICRT. And I is equal to the ionization constant. It's how many ions. And the big thing for this is um, when something is dissolved in a solution, how many ions does it make? So sucrose, um, sugar, when it dissolves, it just stays sucrose and just breaks apart. So it's got one ion per every sucrose molecule. Sodium chloride, on the other hand, is an 
is an ionic compound. It breaks apart into sodium ions and chlorine ions. So it breaks apart into two ions. So its ionization constant is two because it makes two ions per every sodium chloride molecule. Next, C is the molar concentration, and they will usually give you these numbers that you'll be plugging into the equation. It's usually in moles, um, and that's the moles of solute per volume of solution. R is a constant, so you'll be given that constant. You don't have to memorize it or anything. And then T is temperature. Big thing is it needs to be in Kelvin. Okay, so Kelvin is our Celsius plus 273 is our Kelvin. So again, the big thing is the more solutes means the bigger our concentration will be, the more negative our value is, because notice this is negative. Um, and more negative means more likely that water will move there. Here's an example showing water potential at different places in a tree. Notice that the water potential down here in the soil is lower than that in the roots. So the water will move um, from the soil to the roots to where it's more negative. And then again, it will move, the leaf is even more negative, so it will move from a root to a leaf. So it's the, just showing the direction that the water is moving. Okay, so here's an example. Um, what is the water potential of a 5 molar sucrose solution at 21 degrees Celsius in an open container? or an open system. The big thing, open system, that's telling us right away that, okay, it's telling us that our water potential is going to be equal to our potential for the solutes because we're not dealing with pressure. It's an open system. So we can assume that water potential will equal our solute potential. So now we can use our solute potential equation. So we're just going to plug in our numbers. So I, our ionization constant, sucrose, it's one, so we plug in one for I. C is the solution, um, the concentration. It tells us it's 0.5 molar. So we'll put in 0.5 molar for C. R, we're gonna use this number down here. And then T for temperature is 21 degrees. But the big thing is we need to first convert it to Kelvin. So we'll do 273 plus 21 and put that in for our temperature. So if you do that and then you multiply it all out, you should get negative 22.22 bars for our solute potential. So don't forget the negative. Negative is very important. And this is, again, because that solute potential is zero. So therefore, our total potential will equal our solute potential. Okay, and that's it. We'll practice some more of these in class.